There was this golfer, and he'd been playing golf for 30 years, and he lived so that he could play at Pebble Beach, which is an amazing golf course. But every time he came to this one hole, and the way this hole is laid out from the tee box, it's a par three, but from the tee box, you actually have to hit out over the Pacific Ocean, and you've got to make the ball curl to the right to land on the green, right? And this guy had been playing golf for 30 years, and he had never hit the green. He probably played the hole 150 times, and 150 times the ball he hit off the tee went in the Pacific Ocean, okay? And it was on his bucket list just to get the ball on the green. And so he, and he never would use a new ball. He'd always look in his bag and find the oldest, cruddiest ball because he knew it wasn't going to make it to the green. So that morning, he teed up the ball, an old, cruddy-looking ball. And before he hit the ball, he got down on his knees, and he said, God, you know it's been a dream of mine all my life to hit this, t- hit this ball off the tee and land on the green. Father, you know this is on my bucket list of things to do. And I am asking, Father, help me put the ball on the green. And he stood up, and he he addressed the ball, and he got ready to tee. And just as he got ready to tee off, a voice from heaven said, Stop. Step away from the ball. Practice swing. So he's like, this is awesome. God's going to let me do this. This is awesome. He stepped back from the ball, and he did a practice swing. A voice from heaven says, Give me another practice swing. He backs up and he gives another practice swing. Then the voice from heaven says, put a new ball on the tee. And he's like, I got this. I got this. And so he gets up to address the ball, and the voice from heaven says, one more time, give me a practice swing. So he stepped back, and he gave a practice swing. And the voice from heaven said, put the old ball on the tee. Yes, some of you will get that this afternoon. If you ever played golf, you got it right away. But, you know, the thing thing that's so important here is we have so many different views of God. Some of us think about God as this, this grandfatherly figure sitting on a throne up in heaven. And he's too busy for us. Some of us have a, a view of God that he's this strict disciplinarian. And he's sitting there waiting for us to screw something up so that he can pop us. And some of us have this view of God that God is, is a friend. He's, he's my friend. I know, I'm going to date myself now. Do y'all remember that movie that came out years and years ago where George Burns was God? Oh, yeah. A lot of us have that's who God is, you know, this, this, this kind of person. And then a lot of us, what we do is we take the attributes of our earthly father and we put them on God. So if our earthly father was good, God is good. If our earthly father was absent because he was always working and busy, then God's absent and, and he's working and he's too busy. If our earthly father was not a good father, then neither is our heavenly father. We all do that. We all have this mental picture of who God is. And our view of God is literally based on something we can see, touch, taste, and smell here on earth. And I got to tell you, none of those are right. None of those views of God are right because God is God. God is God. And we can't even begin to fathom who God is except for the fact that the Bible says he loves us. The Bible says that he set up a plan of reconciliation to draw us as sinful men back to a holy God even before the beginning of time. I'm starting a brand new series this morning that I'm calling Who is God? Uh, Granted, I I tried to come up with another names for this, but really, Who is God? Because that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to spend the next several weeks looking at what the Bible says about God. Hopefully during this series, 
we can take those distorted views that we've had all our life about who God is and change them and have a more realistic view of who God really is. It's hard for us. You know, we are finite beings. We, we have a finite lifespan and, and, and a finite brain. And we're trying to talk about somebody, this, this heavenly being, this God of heaven and earth that isn't like us. You know, we think because the Bible says we were created in his image, he's like me. He's bald and has to have contacts to see. And then again, I look at some of you, and maybe he's you. But what does the Bible say? Who is God? So over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at God's different attributes. And I think it's so important for us to understand, no matter what our view of God is, it affects the way we live our lives. Who we think God is directly affects how we live our lives. So what I hope we do over the course of this series is we get a better understanding of who he is, and then that becomes what affects our lives, and that becomes how we act about God, towards God, and how we view God. Our view always affects everything. It always does. Let me ask you, how many of you brought your Bibles this morning? Will you raise them up? I have missed seeing that. Oh, it looks so good to see that. I see the, the old school Bibles. I see a lot of screens up. If you're online, show me your Bible. Well, you know I can't really see it, but raise your Bible up anyway. I tell you what you could do. If you're online, you can chat and just tell us, I got my Bible. Let me know if it's a, a, a cover Bible or let me know if it's a, a screen on your tablet or your phone. Let us know in the chat section. And somebody who's hosting will respond to that. But, you know, if you've got your Bibles, what I want you to do this morning, if you've got your smartphones, is go to your Version app, go to Menu, click on Events, search for Thrive Church, click on that, save it, and you'll be able to see my notes for this, this morning. So let's. I want to jump right into some scripture. I want to go to the Old Testament. Jeremiah, I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 17. And I gave this to you out of the Living Bible. It says, O Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. I love this last statement. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. Well, as we begin this morning, what I want to do is I want to establish the first fact about God, the first truth about God. It's in your outline, so just get your outlines out and look at that. This first fact, this first truth is, is mind-blowing. It's something we can't even wrap our brains around, but we're going to try to this morning. God is omnipotent. That's a strange word. It's a fancy word. But the easiest way to understand what that means is to break the word down. So if you look at the first part of the word, omni, omni actually means all. It just simply means all, okay? And potent means powerful. So God is all powerful. Again, we understand that by our minds. We understand that with what we have in our being, okay? Okay. But whatever it is you think all-powerful means, you're just grazing the surface. You're just seeing the tip of the iceberg to try to understand what all-powerful means. This is an important attribute of God that what I want to do this morning is kind of expand our horizon, expand our view of what all-powerful means, okay? So in our minds, if we think of something as all-powerful, we relate it to something we understand, okay? Now, for me, I'm deep, okay? For me, I am just a real deep theological, philosophical thinker. I think of Superman. Now, I'm not talking about them crazy movies over the last 20 years. I'm talking about the TV show from the 50s and the 60s, okay? That was Superman. Right now, and I think about that. Superman is this guy. Now, I just, I, I really, I, I don't believe God wears a Superman uniform. Okay, but Superman was this guy dressed in red and blue tights with this big S on his chest. But he was a mild-mannered reporter named Clark Kent. 
But whenever Lois Lane was in trouble, he stepped up, okay? He stepped up. He saved her just in the nick of time. And if you think about the beginning of the Superman TV show, by the way, you can go YouTube it. It's cool, right? What did they say? Superman, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a able to leap in a single bound. Oh, man, that is so cool. And I'll even give it to Christopher Reeves in the first Superman movie, okay? The thing I remember about that movie was that bus full of people that was getting ready to go off the bridge, and he saved them. But in order to save them, if you remember the scene, he strained, and he strained, and it took every bit of all the power he could muster up to keep that bus from crashing. God wouldn't have strained. Another thing about God is he ain't got no kryptonite. But you see, in our minds, that's the kind of thing we, alert, we, we, we relate to who God is. God's our Superman, right? But Superman doesn't even scratch the surface of who God really is. He don't need to get more power, okay? God will never, ever, ever break a sweat doing anything. This morning, what I want to do is I want to take some time to contemplate what it means that God is all powerful and then try to wrap our brains around how you and me can go about applying that truth to our lives and change the way we act and change the way we live. It's important because we live based on our view of God and that's only a shadow of who he is. None of us here have a complete view of God in our brains, okay? We don't have a complete view of his character in our brains. And it don't matter how spiritual you are, okay? It don't matter. And quite, I would, I would venture to say that a little kid understands how powerful God is more than we do. Because, you know, they just believe. We get all tainted with the world we get all tainted with the people god puts in our lives that we don't know why why on earth would he do that but as a result our view of god diminishes over time and here's another thing that tell me if i'm wrong whatever you think god to be once you get that figured out in your head you stop thinking about him you don't think about him anymore and when you do, it's just, yeah, that's who he is, you know, Superman. But God is so much more. He is so much more than that. Like I said, none of us have a complete view of God. But what I want to do is I want to take us on a journey. I want us to see if we can expand our view of who God is. So in your outlines, what does it mean? that God is omnipotent? What does it mean that God is so powerful? What does it mean to me? Well, the first thing I think it means is this. Let's just try to describe how powerful he is. God is more powerful than any force of nature. God is more powerful than any force of nature. Now, our limited human minds are unable to grasp the things that are infinite. We are finite. God is infinite. So we can only think in terms that we understand. We can only relate to stuff we can see, okay? So let me give you a couple that God's more powerful than. When I think about power in human nature or in, in nature itself, when I think about power, I think about an F5 tornado. I saw the movie Twister. They had cows. You know? Or I think about a Category 5 hurricane. Now, talk about a force in nature. A building that a bulldozer can't tear down can be destroyed by wind. Pieces of 
of buildings can fly through pieces of other buildings. That's powerful. Let me give you another example. Tsunamis. Japan experienced a tsunami several years back, and it wiped out tons of people and anything that was in its path. About earthquakes. Talk to the people in Haiti. Destroyed almost everything. These are just forces of nature. Now, I don't care how big the tornado is. I don't care how big the twister is. I don't care how tall the tsunami is or how strong the earthquake is. It ain't as powerful as God. Now, when you think about those kind of forces, Superman kind of pales, you know? God is more powerful than any force of nature. Why do you say that, Pastor Steve? Because he controls nature. He's in charge of it. He made it, absolutely. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 13. When he speaks in the thunder, the heavens roar with rain. He caused the clouds to rise over the earth. He sends the lightning with the rain and releases the wind from his storehouses. Jeremiah says that God controls the storms. Jeremiah says that God is more powerful than any storm. In the New Testament, we see how God, through the person of Jesus Christ, controlled the storm. Mark chapter 4. He got up and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why were you so afraid? Well, that's not kind of a dumb question, isn't it? Why do you think I was afraid, Jesus? <laughs> I was about to drown in this storm. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him god is more powerful than all the forces of nature combined and when i think of of powerful voices follow me this is the way my brain thinks so follow me through this when i think of how powerful the forces of nature are i think about the things that are only combined or stuck right here on planet earth you know when we talk about the powers of nature what about the forces of nature and the power and the energy in our sun, in the sun. And when I think about the powers and the forces of nature in our sun, what is that compared to all the suns in the universe? They say that our sun's one of the smaller suns. And when I think about all of the energy and all of the power that are contained in all of the suns and all of the stars in the Milky Way, you understand the Milky Way is just a blip on a radar screen for the rest of the universe. So then when I think of all the power and the forces of nature in all of the universe, I have to come back to the fact that God made it. He created it. He set it in motion. That trumps Superman. Remember the verse we read at the beginning, Jeremiah 20, uh, 32, 17. He said, oh, Lord, you have made the heavens and earth by your great power. Nothing, nothing is too hard for you. Now, think about that. God is infinitely more powerful than anything he's created in all of nature. That's how powerful God is. That brings me to the second point. This is one we get all jacked up. This is one we get all wrapped up in, okay? God is more powerful than, yes, believe it or not, Satan. God is more powerful than Satan. I've said this a bunch of times from this stage. I'm going to say it again. Satan is a created being. What does that mean? God made him, okay? God made him. Now, while Satan is powerful... He is not more powerful than God. In fact, he is not even slightly less more powerful than God. He is infinitely less 
more powerful than God. You know the story. He thought he was somebody. He thought he was better than God. God said, come here, boy, I'm going to smack you. And that's what he did. He kicked him and a third of heaven out. Okay? Now, yes, God allows Satan to move about on this planet. God allows him to use his finite power on this planet. And yes, his power is stronger than our power. God said, that's not a problem. Because I will give you the power of the Holy Spirit. And with the power of Holy Spirit, Satan don't stand a chance. But so many people have this distorted, I don't know, what would you call it, street theology that God is, the, is good and Satan is bad and they are equal. You know that's an insult to God. That is an insult to God. By the way, I read the end of the book. Satan gets his butt kicked. Okay? God is more powerful than Satan. And guess what? We belong to God. John chap 1 John chapter 4 verse 4 says, "But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because, now look at this, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Let's break that down. What does that verse mean? Circle that last phrase. Highlight that last phrase. Rip it out of your Bible and stick it on your refrigerator. Okay? What does that mean? That means that Satan ain't got no authority other than that which we give him. Because he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Anybody got a problem with that? Do I need to break that down farther? So God is infinitely more powerful than Satan. Say it one more time. God is infinitely more powerful than Satan. Okay, you got it now? You know what the problem is? We forget that. We hear that in church, we get all powerful, and you know, we get all churchy. Praise God, hallelujah, you preach it, Pastor Steve. We walk out in the world, and we're the biggest wimps there ever was. The moment, I don't know what it is, the moment we walk out of the doors of the church, our brain cuts off. And so we went around going, woe is me, I don't know what to do, I just, I have no idea. Can you imagine what God thinks of us a lot? Most of the time. I'm sure that he feels most of us are dumber than dirt when we have the power at our fingertips to overcome he who is in the world. God is more powerful than Satan. All right, that brings me to the third one. This is important. This one's really important because we get all mired up in this one. God is more powerful than our circumstances. That's where we get all jacked up. I mean, we don't, we say it here. I hear there, I heard amens when I read it. But we don't believe it. We don't believe it. Throughout scripture, we see that God is not confounded or confined by any circumstance at all. At all. But the fact is, we are. And we get all marred up in it. I want to share two examples with you right from Scripture. This first example, I, I, I asked the ladies in the office, is there any way we can put 14 to 15, maybe 16 chapters of Scripture on the outline and, and talk about it? And they looked at me like I had three heads. So I can't read all this Scripture to you, so I'm going to have to tell you the story. This is the Cliff Notes version of the story as told by Pastor Steve. Here is the greatest example of how God is in the circumstances and he controls the circumstances and he's greater than the circumstances, okay? There was this dude. This is in the book of Genesis. 
there was this dude. His name was Joseph, okay? Joseph was one of 12 kids that his daddy was Jacob, and Joseph was pretty jacked up, okay? Let's just be straight up. He won't the oldest. He won't the youngest. He was probably the dumbest at some point, all right? Because he would say things that inevitably would fire his brothers up, okay? All the time, all the time. And to make matters worse, he was Jacob's favorite. Now, any of y'all in a family of more than two or three, was there a favorite? How did you feel about the favorite? Didn't care for it at all, right? It wasn't fair. All these kinds of things. Well, well, that's who Jacob was, right? So Jacob starts getting these, having these dreams at night. And if he just had kept them to himself, he wouldn't have messed up his whole life, kind of, sort of. But God then wouldn't have got him where he needed to go, right? So Jacob would get up in the morning and say, I had this cool dream, guys. And they tolerated. Until one morning he got up and said, I had this cool dream, guys. Y'all, all 11 of you and daddy are going to bow down to me one day. Well, the brothers decided that was it. That was it. We're going to kill him. Let's just kill him. You ever wanted to kill your brother or sister? I don't understand. I was an only child. I am the oldest. I'm the middle. I'm the youngest. And I'm the most liked. So I don't understand this, but they decided they are going to take Joseph out, okay? But right at the last minute, they said, well, you know, maybe that's not a good, good thing to do. Let's just sell him into slavery. And that's what they did. They sold him into slavery. Do you ever want to do that to your brother or sister? I don't think you should, but anyway. Um, so he becomes a slave. And lo and behold, he winds up a slave in this kind of sort of rich guy's house. His name was Potiphar, okay? And Potiphar kind of liked him. Potiphar's wife thought Joseph was hot. Potiphar's wife, she was like, I want me some of that. And when he, when he rejected her, when he rejected her, you know what she did? She made up a lie about him. She told Potiphar, he's been hitting on me. He's been trying to hit on me. And you know what happened to Joseph? He ended up in jail for several years. Could the situation get any worse? Well, you know what? Lo and behold, after he'd been in jail for a while, somehow or another, he ends up interpreting a dream for the Pharaoh of Egypt. And the Pharaoh says, bring that guy to me. And he proved himself to the Pharaoh. So much so that Joseph went from being a slave in Potiphar's house to being the number two person in all of Egypt. The only person greater than him was the Pharaoh. All right? And Joseph told the Pharaoh, God's going to send a famine to the land. And we need to prepare. And so they did, and Joseph got people to, to bring grain and to bring all anything that they could save for the famine, to bring it into storehouses, and he just loaded everything. So when the famine actually hit, Egypt was the only place you could get anything to eat. Well, lo and behold, it got bad for Jacob and his sons, and they ended up traveling to Egypt. Guess what they did? They bowed down to Joseph. But here's the deal I want you to understand. Where was God? Right there. Right there. God's the one that made sure he got favor in Potiphar's house. God's the one that made sure that the, the Pharaoh found out who he was. God's the one that got Joseph the number two spot in Egypt. And God was the one that got Joseph's brothers to bow down to him. God is in the circumstances. And listen, not one place Joseph found himself did God go, dang boy, I didn't see that happening. Because he did. All of it. He did, right? Right? So, so that's the Pastor Steve Cliff Notes version of about 
15 chapters in the book of Genesis, okay? Bottom line is God was there. Bottom line was God was there. Bottom line was God was there. He is infinitely more powerful than our circumstances. It doesn't matter at all what we're talking about he is more powerful he can control the circumstances he manipulated what was going on to joseph now there's another one another example in the bible did you know that god caused the sun to stand still which sounds like totally ridiculous because the sun don't move the earth does and if it stops moving it I would think it would fall, but God's more powerful than that, right? Do you know the story I'm talking about? Here's the deal. Joshua, powerful man of God, and Joshua's leading an army of Israelites, and they're going to fight a war against the Amorites, and they traveled a long distance to get there to fight these guys, right? And when they got there, there won't much daylight left to have this battle. So Joshua prayed. Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. On the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. He said, let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of, I can't say that word, Suffolk. So, I went to public school, I'm sorry. So the moon, the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place, look at this, until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. Did Joshua cause the sun to stand still? No. God did power over circumstances. And by the way, you know, the sun rises and sets every day. We, we probably, the last couple of weeks, we don't know that for sure, but the sun rises and it sets every day. In fact, it does it so regularly, I would step out on a limb and tell you, you can set your watch by it. That was supposed to be a joke. I'll try the punchline again. It rises and sets so regularly, you can set your watch by it. I bet you the people online laughed, okay? All right? But do you get where I'm coming from? God is more powerful than any circumstance. If God can cause the sun to stand still, if God can take a kid who has been made a slave and make him the second in charge in Egypt, do you think God can't fix your circumstances? God is more powerful than anything you're going through. That's important. It is so important. Whatever you're facing in life, even when it feels like there's no hope. You ever been in a situation that felt like there was no hope? Are you in a situation right now where you're not sure if you got any hope? Look what, look what Isaiah said, Isaiah chapter 46. Don't forget this, old guilty ones, and don't forget the many times I clearly told you what was going to happen in the future. For I am God, I only, and there is no other like me who can tell you what is going to happen. All I say will come to pass. For I do whatever I wish. I will call that swift bird of prey from the east, that man Cyrus from far away, and he will come and do my bidding. I have said I would do it, and I will. God is able to accomplish whatever he says because he is more powerful than anything. He is more powerful than Satan. He is more powerful than the forces of nature. He is more powerful than any circumstance you may ever find yourself in. He can do whatever he says, and he can accomplish whatever he desires. He is all-powerful. So what? So what? He's all-powerful. What does that mean to me? What does that mean to you? What, what does that got to do with where I am, what I'm doing? 
Well, let's talk about how it affects you in closing. Number one, I can trust God to keep his word. I can trust God to keep his word. We just saw in Isaiah that God said, whatever I've said, I will bring it about. We saw in that verse that God says, whatever I've planned, that's what I'm going to do. We can trust God's word. And this is good news, guys. This is good news because God has given us many great and precious promises. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. No matter how many promises God has made, the Bible says they're all yes. Now, I did something because I didn't know, and I would encourage you to do the same thing just to prove that I said what I said is right, okay? I went to Google. Hey, Google. I went to Google, and I typed in how many promises of God are in the Bible. And dang, if Google didn't know, it amazed me. Do you know how many promises are in the Bible? Thank you, John. Over 7,000. Over 7,000 promises God has made in the Bible. Don't believe me. Go check it out for yourself. It blew me away. I think the number is 73 something, but I can't remember it. Over 7,000. To me, that blows me away. To me, that says one thing that is so important, and this is it. I can take what God says to the bank. Whatever he says, it will happen. Whatever he speaks is a yes. That should change the way you view God right there. That should change the way you think about God right there. And that brings me to the second point. Because one of the promises God made is so important. I can trust God to save me. I can trust God to save me. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you openly declare that God is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might get saved. What does it say? You will be saved. Other translations say, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The bottom line is it says, you will be saved. You will be saved. That means that our salvation is totally dependent on God, not me. Your salvation is totally dependent on God, not you. It don't depend on how good you are, how pretty you are, how much money you got. It don't matter whatsoever at all. It is totally dependent on God. And it depends solely on God's ability. I get this. It depends solely on God's ability to keep his word. And guess what? He always does. He always does. To me, that just blows me away. 1 John chapter 5, verse 15 says, And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. You want healing? Ask and believe. You want your marriage fixed? Ask and believe. You want your children fixed? Ask and believe. Whatever we ask, gives us that brings me to the third point i can trust god to meet my needs if he's going to give me what i ask for if he's going to save me if his promises are always yes he's going to meet my needs god is going to meet my needs if he says i will provide for your needs he means it but he expects something from us too Matthew chapter 6, look at verses 32 and 33. Your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Before we ask, he knows what we need. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. You want your marriage fixed? Seek God first. You want your children fixed? Seek God first. 
That means that I need to be focused on God and doing what he wants me to do. And if I'm focused on him and doing what he wants me to do, then he's got the rest of it. That's how powerful he is. He's got the rest of it. That don't mean I get to sit around on the couch eating Doritos and waiting for him to move. Right? It means I do what he made me to do. And he's got the it means you do what he called you to do, and he's got the rest. That is so important. You see, when we focus on God, we be who he called us to be. When we focus on him, we are doing what he wants us to do. God is all powerful, he's all powerful. The bottom line is there isn't any situation that God can be placed in that he can't control. Period. End of statement. He's able to keep his word. He's able to give me strength. He's able to get me through any situation. So here's the deal. And I got to close. Here's the deal. Listen to me. Stop living with a false impression of who God is. Stop, att stop attributing God the attributes that are earthly. Stop thinking of God as your father or your doting grandfather or your absent father or your mean father and start looking at God for who he is. Glorify him. Find real contentment that way. When we pray this morning, what I want you to be praying silently is this. First, if there's anybody in this room that doesn't know Jesus, pray for Holy Spirit to move in their heart this morning. But secondly, what I want you to pray for is ask God. I want you to say, God, help me see you as you are. It'll change your life. Let's pray. God. Father, help us see you, who you as you are. Start showing us your great power. Let us see who you are. I know Moses has to see you. And you put him in the back of the cave and you made him put his head against the wall and close his eyes and he nearly got blinded when you walked by. Father, help me stop looking at you like I looked at my earthly father, who was good, who was amazing. But that's just a glimpse of who you are. Help me realize how much power you have. And help me realize that that power is in, within me because you've given me Holy Spirit. Let me stand in the mantle of that and walk in the mantle. And Father, that's what I pray for every person in this room, every person in the sound of my voice online. Help us start seeing you for who you really are. Keep your eyes closed just for a moment. Whether you're in this room or you're online, here's the deal. If you don't have a relationship with the God that created you, hear me, hear me. He desires that relationship more than you could ever imagine. He loves you so much that he allowed Jesus to come to this earth for the express purpose of dying on a horrific cross, a horrible death. And in doing so, he took the sin of the world to himself. The Bible even says at that moment, God couldn't look at him. And he died and he was buried, but he rose again on the third day. And the Bible says, if we believe that with all of our heart and ask him to come into our lives, he will. I'm going to pray a short little prayer this morning in closing. We call it the sinner's prayer. If you've never prayed this prayer, if you desire a relationship with Jesus, whether you're in this room or you're watching on the sound of my voice online, Pray a prayer that's something like this. You don't have to say it out loud, but if you feel compelled to scream it as I pray it, go for it. But pray something like this. God, I need you. God, I'm a sinner. I've done so many things so wrong, and I just ask you to forgive me of that right now. 
I believe you sent Jesus to die for me. I accept what you did. I believe it. And right now, in the quietness of this moment, I'm asking you to come into my life. I'm asking you to come in, Father, and establish a relationship with me. I don't want to live without you anymore. And I'm asking this with all the faith I can muster and believing it. In Jesus' name, amen.